Well, welcome back. Uh, this is what a great day. Uh, that last session was inspiring. Uh, it's just so exciting to see folks who are doing the work and engaged. I could talk for hours to reflect on that, but that's not my role here. My role is to get out of the way. Let's hear from the experts here on this last session of the day, reflections on truth, justice, and reconciliation. We have six experts, uh, one who is on the Zoom screen and the other in person, Carrie, unfortunately, uh, uh, has a, some ill family members and uh, we hope everyone's well uh, in New York or San Francisco, wherever he is right now. Um, but we have six lovely panelists with you and we're gonna do lightning introductions real quick. We're gonna start today by hearing from Nancy Rogers, former Dean of the Law School, former Ohio Attorney General. She'll be providing reflections on her forthcoming work framing and initiatives to advance racial equity. Of course, Nancy is based here at the Morris College as well. Sion Kang on, on Nancy's left is a, a postdoctoral fellow at the Mershon Center for International Affairs and will be providing reflections connected to her forthcoming work, constructing community cohesion organically and strategically. Then we'll hear from Jan McDonald and her virtual co-author, or Jan McDonald, Jan Martinez and her virtual co-author, Carrie McDonald. Uh, Jan, of course, is based at the Stanford uh, uh, Stanford Law School at the Gould Center, as is Carrie, and they'll be reflecting on their forthcoming article, California and New Truth Commissions, Designing Racial Equity Processes in Silicon Valley and the Costs and Benefits of Technological Innovation. All right, and then last, we'll be hearing from Amy Schmitz here at Moritz and Bodeji Tian. Did I get it right? Close enough. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at the at HNMCP or the Harvard Negotiation and Mediation Clinical Program, we will be reflecting on uh, their paper, uh, Technology Driven Racial Reconciliation. They're each going to take four to five minutes uh, to reflect on what they've heard today, and particularly in the last panel, uh, the last conversation about from those folks who are doing the work through the they're going to reflect on that through the lens of their forthcoming work. And as in our prep call, Nancy framed so nicely, I'm going to kick it off with one question for all of you to, to respond to in your opening reflections. Specifically, each of you are looking at how public officials and residents can work together to advance racial equity and justice. What are your suggestions to those in the audience who might be considering engaging, initiating, or working in this work? I'm not going to interrupt. Nancy's going to start. She's going to pass the microphone to Suyong. Suyong is going to pass it to Jan, to Carrie, to Amy, and all of you. So, Nancy, I'll see you in, in 30 minutes. Go ahead. Well, I think part of what was exciting in the last panel um, was caused because those commissions were publicly created a combination of public community representatives engaging the whole community and also that they were working on a number of things at once. They were talking about uh, telling the truth, uh, achieving change, making amends, uh, bringing about mutual respect, and so on. Sequencing a multi-pronged uh, series of goals. And it is those, uh, those efforts that uh, we have been studying particularly because we think they are so exciting. They have so much potential to advance racial equity as a process. Um, but they create themselves challenges that are really tough, as you heard on that last panel. And I am one of a multidisciplinary effort uh, that includes several on this panel, it includes our, our moderator, it includes our director, Carl, and many others studying these efforts to examine what barriers they are facing, but in greater detail to identify the promising ideas to overcome those barriers. So that as more and more of these initiatives are being created, we can pass on those good ideas. And with Brand Lump and Sarah Cole, I am doing one very small slice of that, looking at challenges and overcoming. We are looking at the challenges in the area of framing. So I want to say, first of all, that, that framing matters. As you heard from Amber on the last panel, 
uh, what Charleston faced because of framing and required some reframing ultimately to move forward, um, it matters. But secondly, there is no discipline, including the wonderful disciplines represented here, that has the recipe for these multi-pronged public community initiatives. Um, it's not mediation. It's not, the recipe is not there in restorative justice. It is not there in political persuasion. It is not there in community-based advocacy uh, because the goals and contexts are so different. So there's no off-the-shelf framing advice, although there is wisdom in all of those disciplines that one can pull on. The thing that makes it, as somebody said, brave work on uh, the part of these commissions is that the goals and therefore the advice about framing often conflicts. So I'm going to give you just two examples of that uh, because I have only four minutes and uh, a couple of promising ideas that we've observed. So the, the first uh, builds on John Powell's presentation. There is a tendency uh, to divide us in bitter ways, uh, ways that are hard to, uh, to overcome by making it a zero sum game. Uh, those immigrants are gonna take our jobs. Um, and uh, so in order to make progress, since that as we know from the literature that it's not the most productive frame for engaging broadly for change. Um, in order to do that, as John says, you can look at it as a, a, we all gain. Um, and it's been said many, many, many ways. At the same time, we heard about building trust, enough trust that people will come forward, and the ways in which commissions often build that, coming from community activism, is to make sure they use the words that people use in that community. Uh, uh, be sure that they are authentic in the voice. And sometimes the authentic voices do quite a lot of, of uh, saying that other people need to give. Yeah, it's time for them. So let me just give you an example from the New York Commission on how they handled that dilemma, both of those reasons being valid. Um, they presented uh, some concerns from community members um, that did include some non, some zero sum language. Uh, so for example, Uh, they said, this is what we heard. Uh, we heard that every, that, um, we heard that wealthier neighborhoods need to take on more burdens or responsibilities to relieve low income and BIPOC communities of the environmental health issues and other barriers to well being. So that doesn't quite fit John Powell's uh, recipe. So they had another column where they said, unpacking what we heard. And this came in the interim staff report. Every neighborhood should allow New Yorkers to enjoy public spaces, well-supported schools, and a healthy and clean environment. Yet this is not the case in our city. So it was the targeted, um, uh, uh, universal targeted, <laughs> the John Powell approach of, of this is not a zero-sum game. One more example, and then I'm going to pass it on, is, um, is the ways in which um, the commissions have explained why they need to do things that are upsetting to hearers who need to hear them. So, for example, the history, uh, you will often hear people say, why do we have to dredge that up? That truth-telling divides us. And yet people are not really willing, there, there are many reasons why it's important to say that and these commissions must all do that. Um, and so one way, and this is, goes back to the wonderful and story South Africa Truth and Reconciliation Commission, is to explain in a memorable way why that's necessary, why it's necessary to look at painful history that makes many people feel guilty. 
Um, and Judge Freeman actually said that the same thing very quickly. But I want to quote Bishop Tutu because he said it in a way that's been quoted over and over again, um, and taking the time to put it in a way that is memorable. And having the chair say it, having someone who was well known say it, who delivered this message because it was so crucial to frame it. For us, truth was at the heart of reconciliation, the need to find out the truth about the horrors of the past the better to ensure that they never happen again. And that's the central significance of reconciliation. Without it, people have no sense of safety, no truth, no confidence in the future. The aim must be to build a shared future from a divided past. So he pulled those two groups together. Um, we're, we're looking for ideas and we, we have more ideas, but we continue to watch ideas and continue to be amazed by the dedication and creativity of these commissions in coming up with what seems to be uh, a challenge that almost has no way to overcome it or to meet it. Nancy, and thank you so much for having me here. Felt a uh, privilege to be among such deep and scholars. Um, and as you mentioned, the last conversation was so rich. And they really are the experts. I, I just feel like a fly on the wall. Really. <laughs> um, and some of the lessons that pertain to how um, public officials can work with the local community, um, especially what uh, Anisha was sharing, resonate um, or dovetail some of the lessons that I've uh, detailed. And so I'll briefly give an overview of my paper and then highlight some of the, some of those lessons as well. And so. Um, while local leaders may know best the needs of their community, they often seek outside help um, with understanding how to adjudicate between differences, facilitate community-wide di community dialogue, um, and to respond constructively to divisive issues. And the Divided Community Projects Academy Initiative has here at Moritz um, is one such resource that uh, comes, al comes alongside local leaders to partner in the work towards uh, building community cohesion and addressing community tensions. So in my, in my paper, I focus on three different communities' experience with the Academy Initiative, um, and I conduct semi-structured interviews um, with community leaders in these localities to draw out some of the benefits and challenges um, these community leaders face since participating in the Academy. So among the three communities, one was a small liberal arts college in Ohio, and the other two were sizable cities in Indiana and North Carolina. And there's a whole host of other differences, um, but despite these differences, there were also similar lessons and challenges, and I'll highlight the generalizable learnings and implications um, now. So prior to any learning points, um, the Academy's first real value added, I think, was in helping to identify individuals um, who wanted to work together to create a stronger community in each locality, in each locality and provided the time and the space um, for the community leaders to be present um, and to build trust with one another. And so often these um, core leadership groups, as they are called, are comprised of both public officials as well as local leaders who may or may not have official like, formal titles. Um, the Academy then enabled participants to listen, connect, and learn from facilitators and members of other communities, and also illustrated how principles underlying community divisions and unrest were not unique to any one community. Uh, the structure and the activities of the Academy then provided the community leaders um, to hone their perspective taking skills through simulations and role playing. And so on the theme of how public officials um, or recognized community leaders can work with the rest of the public to build cohesion um, and to address tension, this is particularly, sa particularly salient. Um, and several participants mentioned that they gained a new sense of understanding and empathy for what others in the community might be experiencing. Um, another key takeaway was the importance of communication and ways to improve communication and really relationships um, within the community. So whether that is communication among the community's leaders um, or in interacting with the general public, the Academy provided ideas to refine and fine tune existing practices. Uh, one interesting insight 
from the interviewees uh, was that many strong or tight-knit communities are often characterized by informality and personal relations, and there's sometimes a resistance to formalizing or standardizing things out of a sense that it's not genuine or organic. Um, but formal dialogue and strategic plans or not, uh, strategic plans are not or don't have to be mutually exclusive to fostering community communication. And third, uh, most community leaders recognize the need for community buy-in, but weren't sure how to achieve that. Um, and the Academy Initiative allowed ideas um, to be shared and germinated across different communities. And each community ended up implementing um, different strategies towards this aim. So for example, Kenyon College started an advisory group of sorts um, with representative of different sub-communities that regularly came together to discuss rather broader campus concerns. And then in Bloomington, they created task forces led and directed by the residents and specifically invited individuals representing underserved populations to join. And so the city leaders really gave the, the residents agency and the access to the city's resources. So in sum, I think a prerequisite um, in all of this is that there needs to be some kind of collective leadership and a shared vision to make the community better. And this is something that has to be built locally. But once there is an identified group uh, of local leaders who are willing to work together, outside experts can provide insights and ideas on how to increase perspective taking, improve communication within local leadership and across the community and to meaningfully include a broader segment of the community into conversations to strengthen cohesion. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Really close. <laughs> Hold it really close. Okay. Really close. Very close. Um, close. See that close? All right. yeah. um, first, thank you to Bill, Carl, for Ohio State for inviting us. Uh, this is really exciting to be able to share some of my thinking around design, uh, systems design, uh, but also to hear the rich panels today on the actual experience on the ground. Uh, I'm from San Francisco, and there, my colleague, Carrie on the big screen and I are working with uh, public officials in San Francisco. And so as I touch on system design elements that I think might be relevant, uh, running it through the lens of who are the public officials, uh, who are the engaged parties, uh, and what are they focused on? What is their goal? What are they trying to accomplish? And what kind of processes are they tapping uh, using to engage the different interested parties. So thinking on the who part, the public officials in San Francisco were touching on uh, the district attorney's office, the Human Rights Commission, the state of California task force, uh, as well as other state indigenous uh, Native American truth and healing commissions. So we have overlapping jurisdictions and mandates. And I think that's an issue and a challenge that other areas in the country may be facing as well. So are they complementary? are they parallel? Are they perhaps have more or less resources to do their job? The goal is an interesting one. Uh, we started uh, this panel by saying we were focused on public officials and residents engaged to address acknowledge and address uh, the issues around racial inequities. And so in the case of California, you may have read in the paper, the concern on the reparations task force, what does reparations mean? How much money does that mean? Who are the eligible parties to receive it? Uh, and so there's a real strain in deciding who should make the decisions, who should make the trade-offs, and who should receive or be the beneficiary of uh, those uh, funds or resources. It's complicated by the mandate being very wide ranging. Uh, it's not just land use and housing uh, or reparations for a history or a lineage of slavery, uh, but it's education, it's health, it's transportation, it's criminal justice. And so all these pieces are important elements in the overall system that is trying to deal with racial inequities. So then 
uh, thinking about how uh, how are you going to respond to the racial inequities? Is it an apology by the governor? Uh, is it a uh, convening a task force or a committee or subcommittee uh, that will address the issue? Will gather the data. And will they gather uh, histories, the personal stories that we heard uh, that have been handled in a number of cities? But at what cost does that come? It's a resource to hire able uh, documentarians and historians to gather those stories in a respectful way to minimize the trauma that is experienced both by those speaking and those listening. And so who makes those decisions? And what are the trade-offs of transparency and the uh, full information that is being sought uh, against the benefit of having that record on which to draw for a recompense? So I think the trade-off issue, the overlap and jurisdiction issue are both signal uh, challenges that are arising in different cities and jurisdictions and that we'll want to share that information is suggested we should gather in two years and do a <laughs> retrospective on a number of these uh, commissions and what has happened over the longer term because that will be valuable in backward mapping into what we should recommend for structure in process. So long as there's no pandemic. Yeah, uh, yeah. I uh, Just real quick, I just want to pick up on Jim and I appreciate you answering one of the questions that was posed to the last panel, particularly should public leaders play role X, Y, and Z, the apology, the uh, facilitator, the convener, yeah. the, uh, per, the folks who are, are focused on developing these initiatives. And there, there are varying roles for those, those individuals to play. And I, I just appreciate how, how you highlighted that. And I'm sorry to intervene. I said I wasn't going to, but I, I can't help myself. But uh, I think, are you passing to Carrie? I am passing to Carrie. So Beautiful. Carrie, take it away. Okay. You'll need to come up mute. I probably have little to add as usual to anything Jan would say. Um, I'll, I'll reiterate the thanks for everybody's um, uh, invitation of us here for o Ohio's hosting and everybody's patience uh, with my deciding that uh, uh, with a sick household, it was unwise during during COVID to jump on a plane. Um, but uh, I think what, what resonated with me, I'll sort of emphasize what resonated with me from the last panel, which was, how much work each of these commissions is really being asked to hold. Um, they're all attempting, and, and this, this resonates with the work um, that we're studying in California as well, and our, our partners in San Francisco, the, the need to excavate truth, excavate personal experience, uh, repair past harms, um, develop a scope around narrative change, social change, new framing, um, provide promises for a break from the past and the fact that new harms won't be repeated. Um, the layer we heard uh, uh, that, that came up re at, at our recent symposium was not just the, the, the concern around trauma healing for those we ask from the community to engage um, these sort of official processes, but for the, the, the conveners themselves. Um, we heard many people uh, amongst the panel could confess that 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 while this had been their life's work, really diving deep in it in, in the course of um, these commissions had sort of uh, created for them a need to sort of turn to um, similar resources. Um, all, all of this, uh, the other thing I heard was was Terry's evocation of magical thinking, which I think is a, 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 an interesting framework around uh, the timeline a lot of these commissions are asked to work on. Um, they're, they're turning around reports within a handful of years, um, largely, I think, to respond to the framing question of this panel, which is how do we uh, engage uh, political officials on their own timeline? There's a political reality in California um, that will allow for um, the legislatures that have uh, uh, initiated some of these bodies to be fairly intact in a, in a handful of years, but there's no guarantee of that going forward. and. Um, if, uh, if I can quote Eric McDonald, for, who's the chair of the San Francisco African American Reparations Commission uh, Committee um, within the Human Rights Commission, um, you know, he said centuries of harm require centuries of repair. And we are not working on that time scale with respect to these. Um, so, so briefly, um, 
you know, I, I'm actually going to cede the, the conversation about technology to Oladeji and Amy at first, because I think that the challenge in, in San Francisco is that technology is both um, complicated by the sector stigma um, within the city. It is complicated by uh, a, a pretty stiff um, digital divide, and it's complicated by pretty onerous public convening rules, um, uh, which require a certain amount of transparency. And I think their innovation should sort of lead, their innovative thoughts should sort of lead that conversation. Um, but I think in terms of the transition to public officials and also the sort of uh, transition to the public's appetite for these, I was, I was very moved by John Powell's um, targeted universalism framework and hearing echoes of it in, um, I think, uh, Anusha's call for uh, uh, their work in New York to, to match the aspirations of the whole city. And also the work in Minnesota, um, I think it was Professor Brewer, um, but it could have been Je um, Judge Freeman as well, uh, who were speaking to the, the peeling back the liberal, liberal veneer of the city. I think when, when I think about the work in California, it's going to have to take that step. And that that step really hasn't been planned for or thought for in the design of any of these commissions. Um, how this work gets handed off to a legislature and how it gets owned by the public at large is sort of outside the legislative mandate or the design thinking that um, Dan has brought up to date. Um, and that's a big and important step um, that's absent so far and much of the Californian thinking. Thank you so much. So let me just start by saying how much of a delight it is to be in Ohio. Um, and I wanted to start by recognizing and acknowledging um, the indigenous communities whose land Ohio is currently based in, um, from the Seneca, the Ojibwe, to the Miami, um, to the Wyandots, and to the Cherokee. So Amy and I, we've been working on this paper called the um, Technology, um, sorry, yes, Technology Driven Racial Reconciliation, to get it right and precise. And really the main role that this paper is proposing is the role that technology can play in complementing in-person truth and reconciliation commission proceedings. So we can even use the last panel as a point of departure. And certainly this entire symposium, there have been, in my opinion, two main recurring themes that have come up. And the first is that the importance of increasing access for more stakeholders to be involved in the process. And it's hard after experiencing the pandemic to ignore technology's role in doing that. So the more stakeholders, especially those that have been previously excluded from the process are actually and actively involved in the process. And the second is the flexibility and optionality that comes with technology. So we can even use this symposium, how the symposium is structured today as an example, right? So we have this hybrid model with in-person attendees and panelists, and the last panel was remote. And then we also have folks that are calling in from around the country. And they're all able to engage in these innovative ways and have breakout groups where they can talk about, uh, with facilitators and talk about proposals for engaging with truth and reconciliation commissions. So from my perspective, I, I think it's really important to think strategically about how technology can play this leading role and complementary role when we are dealing with these difficult conversations about inequities and, and racial injustice. So there are a few examples that Amy, Colin, and I have proposed and two specific examples are simply just online forms. Having online forms so that folks from around the country can engage with different communities about their experiences. And online forums also introduce unique methods um, for advancing reconciliation. So we, we hear a lot about how storytelling is really important. And we see with digital arts and art in general that um, there are a variety of ways where people can share their stories through art or digital arts. And in Lebanon, uh, Lebanon had a form of a truth and reconciliation commission. We talked about in our paper where people represent their experiences in the, in the Lebanese civil war through digital arts. And it's a point of departure for conversations and difficult um, conversations that folks have had um, with one another. And the second that I really like is ephemeral messaging. So messages that can vanish after a certain period of time. 
And many stakeholders that engage in truth and reconciliation commissions often fear that their opinions will define their lives or certainly define employment or define how people view them in the future. And so ephemeral messaging is just one example where after X amount of time, your message is not memorialized, it, it vanishes. And so you can be more candid. There's more opportunities for candor through this example with ephemeral messaging. So the overall aspiration is that we can think concretely about how technology in this pandemic and post pandemic world can support in person proceedings in truth and reconciliation commissions. Amy, I'll leave it to you to go in more depth. So um, I'll be brief. If this, can you hear me well? All right. So first of all, um, just again, thank you. Um, it's been a true pleasure. I feel so honored to be part of this project um, and to be working with Ola Daisy and Colin. Um, but I really want to emphasize just a few things. It was well said by Ola Daisy. Um, but first of all, one of the points made earlier today about not just rearranging the deck chairs, and that really stuck with me and with my thinking about how we need to sort of blow the lid off of the way we do things. Right? If we really want to make change, we need to take risks. And technology opens up new doors that we never even imagined. Um, Ola Deji shared about digital art, right? Also, you know, we think about all too often, you know, I really like the comment made earlier also that technology is power, right? Technology is power. What that means is that we have to be ethical by design when we include technology in the dialogue. That means we have to address the issues of negative dialogue. We do not want to open up another Facebook. That is not what we are recommending, right? We want to be very intentional and strategic in the way we create these online spaces. I also think it's important, this dynamic aspect of technology. Another theme that we heard, especially in the last panel, is that you have to be strategic at the outset, but you got to be ready to change. And what's beautiful about technology is that it's so dynamic. There's so much we can do that we don't even know about. Next week, the week after, I mean, there's so much more that we can do that we have not even started to scratch the surface. And if we can use technology toward good, to me, that is incredibly exciting. And we're hoping that our paper can sort of open dialogue for that change. Well, thank you all. This is a great, great start. And we have about 20 some minutes that we're going to engage in discussion. I'm going to kick it off with one question that picks up on the thread of ethics that Amy just mentioned in, uh, from the prior conversation. Then we're going to go to participant questions, which Carl is already chatting me, so I've got them, I've got them uh, for us. But I want to go back to ethics and intervention in engaging individuals. On the last panel, Terry asked, what are the ethics of giving voice to people in this context. And I, I think about this, I think it touches all of your frames, it touches technology. You know, what if we don't have access to uh, technology in rural communities, but we have a statewide truth and reconciliation process or indigenous communities or redlined communities? What, Nancy, the example in New York you had, there's community engagement. Uh, the uh, city says, look, we want the uh, rich neighborhoods to pay more, right? The residents do. That's what I heard the first time. The second time, the staff reframed to take John Powell's approach. What are the ethics of reframing? Should we not uh, simply just uh, highlight and uplift and empower the voices that we hear? But how are we able as uh, facilitators, as designers to empower folks to shift the framing, to shift the conversation towards something that's more constructive? Um, and what is on our prep call? You uh, you raised uh, some historical or some international truth commissions. For example, uh, one in Rwanda. It's ongoing. Another one in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo met for 1.5 years, and they have a document on a shelf. It's collecting dust, I'm sure. But with respect to that, in DRC, were they asking people to tell stories, and for what end? In Rwanda, are they asking folks to continue to re-traumatize themselves by having this ongoing process? So I think there's a lot in, in this question about the ethics of giving voice to people through these commissions. So I'd love to uh, perhaps start back with technology and hear from others uh, and get their reaction to this. The tech folks first. Well, I'm not on the tech. Uh, That's okay, Jane. Go right ahead. Okay. All right. Hold me close. Okay, uh, I have two thoughts. One is to give people choice. 
So I think one thing is uh, certainly technology has facilitated the ability to record as someone's story. But I can imagine someone, um, Olivia, hey, you and I spoke about this at lunch, uh, graphically capturing what happened in uh, the Fillmore District of San Francisco, show a geographical uh, picture of the houses and who lived there over time. And so I can see myself in that neighborhood, but I don't have to tell my story in so many words. So I think giving choice um, to the participants and graphically giving alternatives might be- If everyone could hold the microphone closer, I've seen okay. requests. Okay. Yeah, I'll just zoom in on the choice piece because I think that's particularly important if we want to be fully inclusive and have more voices represented. And Amy, Colin, and I, you know, we, we write about these experiences of different communities who are so accustomed to engaging in multiple ways exclusively online and expecting or requiring them to drive or to come in person to to the person to the reconciliation commission uh, proceedings can be alienating to a certain extent. And certainly when the technology is able to meet people on their own terms, you know, um, Carrie is in San Francisco, we're meeting him on his own terms. And I think that's really powerful from the comfort of his home for him to be able to engage and share these narratives, right? That's really powerful. And I would just add a couple of small points. Um, number one, um, when you think about using technology, also being mobile friendly helps a lot with the digital divide, which is something sort of very practical. Um, but also what I really enjoyed from the last panel, when you think bottom up and top down, technology can really sort of open up a new door, but again, not closing any doors and always allowing choice. I think that's absolutely important. And another piece I just wanna add from the last panel is having the resources available, yes. mental health resources, other resources and have it dialed in, right? So you're not just sort of saying, hey, tell us your stories, but you're actually providing the resources for healing. I think that's absolutely vital. Carrie, see you on Nancy. Anything else? I'll pass the mic down. Well, I think when people appoint a commission, they appoint a commission in part to frame for the public mm -hmm. um, how they should look at the how they look at the question productively. Uh, and so I think it's a positive ethic to report this is what we heard, and then right next to it, this is how we see it. Um, but I you raised an ethical question, perhaps, Bill, you see an ethical problem. I don't. I'm affirming exactly what you're saying. I think that New York approach is just right. Heard what we see. Uh, but I could see uh, some mediators uh, or facilitators who might take a transformative frame, for example, might have an ethical problem with that reframing. But I think in this context, we're not necessarily thinking about our traditional styles of mediation and transformative and facilitative. But I just wanted to reaffirm that point in the context of this question, Nancy. So thank you. And I, I want to just pick up on, I appreciate the appointment. You know, if you look at the commissions in Charleston, uh, New York City, they're so representative of various neighborhoods. Uh, the Indigenous Commission in California, you know, there's their geographical, have geographical representation. If Southern California is not a meeting, they don't have a quorum, right? That's what I understood from one of their calls. They have to have geographical re representation as well, well as uh, representation from, from various uh, uh, communities. Ola Deji, you were raising your microphone. Yeah, I was just going back to part of your prior question in raising Rwanda and the DRC, because I think it's really valuable to look at the international scope because Truth and Reconciliation Commissions is an international enterprise, essentially. So, in the prior panel with the New York City and Charleston um, commissions, there was this question of whether it should be a standing commission. Should it be for a finite fixed period of time or should it just be a recurring commission? And I think the Rwandan example has been pretty powerful where every year they're doing investigations to see the um, developments that's happened during a next period of time. And they're publishing a report on those findings. Um, and it's a part of the government, it's, it's a government institution that is continuously doing these investigations while including um, civil society leaders in the process. So I think thinking about whether we should have a standing commission 
is one of the most important questions. It's a question of resources and it's a question of commitments. And at the same time, the challenges we, we face in American traditions are so historical. And so if it's not for, if the duration is too brief, which is what Manusha and, um, and Amber mentioned, if it's too brief, then it's really hard to get to root causes and to sufficiently explore them. So um, I, I think the Rwanda and TRC is a powerful example, frankly, and we talked about it in our paper as well. Yeah, and I want to pick up on that thread from one of the questions in the chat. Uh, uh, she writes, truth telling is necessary, but in South Africa, the truth telling was mostly about many recent events. Should it be different when that truth telling is about wrongs that took harms that took place many years ago? Uh, for example, when we discuss reparations that are tied to uh, in slavery uh, of uh, black uh, and brown Americans. Should we, uh, is that different? Is the South African experience with respect to truth, truth telling different than what we might experience here with indigenous commissions? And Nancy, I see you going back, going for the mic. I, I just recently heard from the, in the California reparations task force, um, a, a story that was widely reported, more reported than, than their experts at that same meeting. Um, by a woman who had traced back to her great great grandparents who came to California prior to 1850 when California became a state and slavery became illegal and slaves. Um, and she traced a number of her, her ancestors. It was uh, a compelling story, despite the fact that it went back so many years. Uh, and also because she could trace in the generations forward how each was affected by the previous generation. Incredible. Well, thanks for sharing that. I mean, draft California Reparations Report is publicly available, buried on the California Reparations uh, Commission website, but uh, the draft report is, is available. Anyone else want to pick up on that thread? Carrie or Jan? Oh, yeah. I the final report is uh, due in December, so oh. they're they're on the schedule. They're okay. on the plan. I did want to just comment on the last one. I'll turn it to Carrie. Uh, is that um, looking at the Rwanda example? It uh, crosses with the whole notion of who the public officials are. Are they the government that wrought these harms, or is this a new government succeed? So in California, we I mean we changed party. But we have changed governments. And so um, that it, it has an interplay uh, at that level as well. Yeah, maybe one of the distinctions between transformative justice and the trite type of truth and reconciliation mm -hmm. we're uh, thinking about and uh, here and here domestically. Carrie, too. Yeah, I, I, picking up on what, what Jan just says, I mean, we do have this, this challenge of. Uh, uh, asking the very government bodies, and Ola Deji picked up on this as well, asking the, the very bodies um, that have um, administratively carried out much of the, the harm to do, perform the act of reform and contrition and repair right now without the break that many of the international examples provide, you know, without the, the break to a new regime or without the historical break to a new um, form of government or uh, a purged uh, purged occupation are the, the many examples that we can provide there. Um, that's not always the case internationally, but that's often the case. Um, and I think that's why you see such a turn towards community organizations and community partners for this kind of uh, community engagement work. And um, it touches on some of what the last panel spoke about with respect to and this, I think, dovetails with your ethics question, um, how to build trust relationship um, in a short period of time. These organizations also have expertise in doing this kind of research and community engagement often. Um, I think when trying to touch upon this question of history, I think as, as Americans, we're particularly poor at sort of reflecting upon generational trauma. And I don't know that I have a, a, a very good answer about um, how one goes about doing that research off the top of my head, but I, I would think I mean, before we provide bright lines about sort of historical testimony versus um, lived and sort of recent testimony, I, I, I would really want to interrogate that uh, and, and include that in the scope of uh, what this work is, is trying to capture. Thank you, Carrie. Anyone else on this thread? And I have a couple more questions from the chat. 
So I, one, uh, David Johnson connects, um, he knows that many issues now are tied to corporate America, right? Uh, and you notice what's happening, for example, in uh, the war in Ukraine and Russia. Corporations are pulling out of Russia, right? McDonald's and Starbucks, et cetera, they're pulling out. How do you get corporate America on board to the work that is happening? Have you seen anything that's worked from your observations in California or New York City or Charleston or the communities that uh, Suyon that you referenced? Uh, particularly noting that uh, I, and I'm going to mess these statistics up, and I'm sorry for it, but I believe up on the NPR marketplace, they reported that something like $500 billion uh, of corporate money was committed towards race equity work in the summer of 2020. And something like less than 3% of that money has actually uh, been uh, spent uh, on race equity work. So uh, in that context, the corporations, uh, corporate America is making public commitments. Maybe the money's not there. What's your reaction? And how do we engage corporate America in this work to make sure there's buy-in from that particular community to advance equity? Well, you answered your question. Well, you answered your question the way that I was going to answer. Uh, what's done pledging money? I mean, I saw that in the same report that they pledged so much money, especially in the wake of all the protests. But I think it just goes to show that this work is so pioneering. And it is great because Nobody really knows how to do it. And so people, I guess, like us and, you know, like past um, previous panels, uh, we're trying to enact something. Um, maybe you rely on those funds um, to help with the work, but it's unclear, you know, the path forward, really. Uh, I, I don't have much more to add. Maybe the answer. And just one um, quick actually, when we can show that there, you make money, right, by doing the right thing. And that is, actually true. If you look at ETFs and you put mutual funds that are towards socially wise investing, you're making money, right? And if you can prove that, I think it helps. Jan, uh, Well, I, I, we need Amber back uh, to talk about Charleston uh, <laughs> because as you watch these uh, commissions operate, one strength of the Charleston Commission is that they have business folks on the commission. Uh, and so their subcommittee put together um, a, a plan, which they are now funding uh, for funding entrepreneurial uh, uh, minority businesses. So um, just listening, you can see that the business people saw the opportunities because they were there engaged in this very hard work. Uh, and they were working with the city people knowing what was feasible for them to add to that process. In fact, the mayor himself came to one of those business discussions. So I think thinking about it at the membership level as well is, is a smart thing to do. I will, I'll just briefly add that truth commissions have, have to always question where the source of their fun funding is coming from. And the extent that that fun source of funding will change the narrative of the reconciliation process. Sometimes it can be a good thing and sometimes it can be a bad thing. And so when the government or local government isn't supporting financially enough the truth commission, you have to really question what is the level of commitment of the local government or the state government? And if a corporation is willing to provide support, what are what's the underlying interest of the corporation providing that funding? Great point. Folks who are, uh, oh, Jerry, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I, I just want to dovetail with what he just said, because there's just a, a very um, complicated tension, particularly in the American uh, urban environment, between the weakness of the public sector and the strength of the corporate sector. Um, and, uh, a, you know, a very quick example that maps not at all onto the, the, the subject of this panel, but in San Francisco, the city government passed a $300 million initiative to deal with housing and homelessness issues, which are deep at the center of uh, uh, the city's sort of economic divides and racial divides. The, within a month of that, the Chan Zuckerberg Philanthropic Fund um, put $500 million towards the same effort, um, and several other corporations piled on uh, with corporate finance philanthropy to the Chan Zuckerberg initiative and, and turn that into a sort of uh, 
a movement that sort of swallowed the public one. It's it, there's this tension between the the communitarian and legitimate activities of the government and what the corporations are capable of doing with their leverage. And I, I, I until we're able to sort of put those on some sort of equal footing, um, that tension will always be there. I just want to take the other perspective for a second and say, if government is funding these processes and government has done the harm, well, that could be a problem for trust as well, right? Uh, so, for example, I, I didn't hear this from the California District Attorney folks last uh, two weeks ago at Stanford, but I'm going to guess, I, I did hear that there were some trust problems with the District Attorney's Office in San Francisco hosting a Truth and Reconciliation Commission because they prosecuted black and brown bodies, right? And so uh, they, um, uh, so where the money might come from the grassroots law, grassroots law project, right? And perhaps from some other uh, nonprofit sources. And so making sure the money comes from the right place might also enhance or reduce trust depending on where those, where the, where the dollars are coming from. Sienna, I saw you uh, pick up the mic, so I want to turn to you. Sure. Now, with um, Amy's comment, I was thinking there's probably a lot of parallels with the sustainability initiative. Um, in the beginning, corporations didn't really know, but there was a huge push for it, so they just donated a lot of money to like World Wildlife Fund and whatnot. And then they, then they started kind of creating an arm of, for sustainability, and then they started creating their products but in more sustainable ways. And you know, now there's probably a diversity officer in every corporate board um but i guess who knows what's next and who knows how transformative that that will be yeah. Amy, go ahead. mine is also just another piece of caution again as much as i like to think about technology as promoting good i'm also want to be very aware of the risks and when we talk about where the money's coming from right um, we have to worry about who owns the data and so when there's going to be data in any kind of an online platform, and so we have to be incredibly intentional and careful on that point, um, especially when there's finances involved as well as the data. Uh, thank you. So I, I want to transition because we have a few minutes left. Carl's going to do a short wrap up in about five minutes or so. So I want to give you all a frame on the last question. I'll probably stumble through it. We'll see. So our North Star today, which is what I heard Dr. Tozar talk about, I also heard Dr. Brewer says something similar, keeping that goal in mind, is the premise of this symposium series, rethinking systems design for racial justice and equity, that continues in April at HNMCP at Harvard on Zoom. So just want to make sure you know that. Uh, we'll get the link out. Uh, and that's our North Star. The last question that Carl sent me here is, how do you see each of your positions as researchers uh, producing research as aiding those on the ground? I don't necessarily want you to answer that question. But what I would like you to do is think of that question and say to people, go back, going back to individuals who are working on initiating, launching, designing, engaged in this work, an anti racist work, whether it's a commission or it's facilitating anti racist conversations or it's uh, wanting to be an anti racist mediator or it's engaging in police. What's one thing from today, one theme from today you want to share back with the audience or one piece of advice from your research that you want to share with the audience here today to close out? And I want to go in reverse order. So uh, I'm not sure if Amy or Oladeji would be first then. Who would like more time to think? <laughs> so I'll, I'll just say that I truly believe that complacency is the enemy of progress. And so when I think about and he said I shouldn't answer this question, but I'll answer it. When I think about our role here, our, <laughs> our role as academics really is to motivate um, policy to, to make change and to not be complacent. So with our article and with future articles, certainly that is, that is our role in academia and to make sure that those voices that have historically been excluded are centered in the work we do. So. Yeah, thank you, Odeji. There's a King quote I've written down for my first and for the first panel, which I wouldn't need or to get to, but uh, the good people who are silent is a problem. That's America's problem. If we are the good people but not silent, we're using our voices to uh, elevate. Uh, those uh, who are marginalized, those who don't have privilege, 
that's that's our opportunity to present things. Sorry, it's really important. Thank you. That was Thank actually you. a perfect segue because that was in my head. Was talking, you know, who? What are the voices we haven't heard? Who is not at the table that needs to be at the table? And I feel like technology and, and digging deeply into ways that we can open up new doors and make sure that those voices are heard. And so being creative in the way that we open up avenues for voice. And sometimes that means harder, harder work. It's hard work to begin with, but it becomes even harder. I mean, there's some discussion earlier today about how when you do open up the doors and you have more individuals involved in the process, it takes longer. It's more difficult, right? It's easier if you just have a small group and you're in a silo but how do we sort of open up and expand access to voice? Sure. Sure. Um, one of the themes from um, our, our look at the various California commissions is the degree to which they were all initiated roughly um, at the same time, but have uh, subsequent to that been, been needing to think through the consequences of their parallel activities uh, sort of in real time. Um, and there's opportunities there for collaboration and synergy and momentum building um, to the same degree that there are, are potential risks um, as well. Um, emphasizing the sort of upside of it, I, I, I keep thinking both, both connecting back to the earlier Stanford um, symposium and throughout today, um, how, how much there really is a, a national opportunities to reflect on each other's work um build on the research and the sort of data and the uh, uh experiential data that we're learning and um uh, build a genuine movement um through this kind of convening so i really appreciate um the opportunity to see that happening in action phil thank you, thank you Jen. yes um uh, i want to go back to your uh, the title of our symposium rethinking uh, and I, I believe the rethinking is the correct word because uh, there, there are systems already in place for dealing with the issues that we're talking about. And there are people who like them that way and they're going to resist change. And so I think the, uh, when I teach negotiations, we talk about creating and claiming value. I think that John Powell gives us an opportunity to create a lot more value by this targeted universalism, and that by that being our means to supplant uh, the zero sum game only, uh, because money, uh, if the tax, as I as a taxpayer, I'm faced with a tax increase, so that my city or my state is going to create better systems and reduce racial inequities. Um, I, I would give my dollar, right? You know, I'd raise my taxes for this, but not everyone would. Uh, so I think uh, I think John Powell's message was a really powerful reset for us to rethink. Absolutely, Sion. Yeah, I guess I just want to reaffirm uh, and commend uh, people doing this work uh, because it is so hard not only addressing racial equity, but just building community cohesion. I remember uh, in one of the communities I was looking at, more than race equity, there was a problem with uh, uh, youth violence and gangs. And uh, one of the kind of a, a community leader that I was talking with, he was talking about how they really wanted to find a space to have gangs come in to kind of help them, you know, understand their perspective and also equip them with resources to uh, you know, be a good force for good in the city. And they have such a hard time finding a place to meet because, you know, tenants wouldn't rent out a space where gang members or former gang members even. And so, you know, when the rubber meets the road, when it comes to your you know, privacy or protection or security, there's, there, there's a tension there. And there's, um, yeah, it's just really hard to live out what we believe to be right in our big mind. So yeah, I commend the commissioners, I commend um, people doing this work, and I thank you, Bill, and BCP for uh, convening us together. Glad to have you, see you. Nancy. Yeah, so I, I'll end this where you began this question, which is I, I do think that the goal orientation uh, is, is some uh, focus that we can keep raising with the good people who are doing this work. Uh, 
um, if they identify those among their aims that are key and the audiences that they need to reach in order to achieve those goals, then they are more likely to solve all of the issues we've been discussing in a very positive way that makes progress. Thank you so much, Nancy. I, I, I always relish the opportunity to follow my teacher, <laughs> which she has been for many years. Um, thank you all. And I, I want the panel to stay here for just a minute so that we can thank them properly. Uh, but you know, we began this journey a few weeks ago on a three-part symposium with a program in California. Uh, and Jan and Terry McClellan, <laughs> I have a friend named Terry McDonald. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Jan, Jan and Terry set the bar so high with the program that they created and presented in California a few weeks ago. This is ambitious work. It's hard work. Uh, it's emotional work. But um, today, uh, I think we continued that journey. Uh, and, you know, we zoomed in a little bit to look at rural Nebraska and conversations that take place in areas that are not diverse, but to talk about race. We looked at policing and drilled down on that issue. And then we zoomed out to look at commissions, governmentally created commissions and grassroots commissions that look at structures and designs to, to deal with these systemic issues in communities as small as Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and as large as New York City. And I'm excited about the papers that we're going to see from a group of diverse scholars and practitioners, and you've seen them in California and today, and you'll see them at HIMCP in a few weeks. We understand this work is difficult and it's messy and it's emotional and it's incredibly important. And I am so grateful to the scholars who have devoted their time and their energies and their intellect to this work. I wanna thank all that have contributed to this work. Um, the scholars and the panelists who've joined us today, uh, especially uh, all of my colleagues and family here at the Moritz College of Law, the Journal for Dispute Resolution, our faculty, our staff, our students who've been with us uh, a good chunk of the day uh, to work on rethinking systems design for racial justice. Uh, and we're going to hand the baton to Neil McGarrigan and, and Sarah Del, Del Nido Budish, who are online. Uh, and I put the link for the April 8th HNMCP program in the chat before I came up here. So if you haven't registered, please do. Uh, we will look forward to seeing you. And lastly, and, and at least from my perspective, most importantly, I want to thank Bill Froehlich, uh, who has shepherded this process for more than a year. Bill does so much of the heavy lifting around the Divided Community Project for the Moritz College along the good work that we try to do, as Nancy says, just to try to do a little good. But I wanted to, to especially thank him for his work here today. So please help me thank this last panel of the day's program. This will conclude our program today. We thank you for joining us. We invite you to continue to engage with us uh, and to let us know what else you think we can bring to you in programming, because we'd love to do it. I love the idea of reconvening in two years, Jan, to see how far we've come. Thank you.